This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good evening, and welcome to my Monday Twilight Show with me, Hannah Wilson. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by Edwina Harvey, and we're going to be talking all things oracy. So, do join in and enter in your questions, or come join the chat. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello and good evening and welcome this Monday night. Uh, so we're going to be chatting about oracy, which has very much popped up into the forefront of everybody's conversations in the teaching world after Keir Starmer uh, declared it the next thing. But uh, Edwina, you have been saying that this is going to be the thing that's going to come to the forefront for quite some time. Hi, good morning. Good- I was about to say good morning. That was wishful thinking. Was wishful <laughs> we are thinking? very close to the end of term. <laughs> <All> <laughs> <close> there. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, no. In no way am I sort of. Uh, did I sort of see this coming? Um, that wasn't me. I would say that um, the the result of kind of the COVID pandemic and um, the w- what happened in terms of um, children not being at school as a result of that, that I would say was the kind of indicator that had a big effect on um, Oracy and its sort of profile. And and the all party parliamentary committee that was created, that they released their inquiry in 2021 following sort of 2020 and COVID. Um, And Voice 2020 and Voice 21 have been doing loads. So um i think it's interesting that it's popped up now i'm kind of interested in that because lots of people have been saying this for a while (laughs) um and probably you know probably a long time um so yeah i think it's quite interesting that it's suddenly kind of come back into the public interest yeah because it was quite a long time ago that it kind of originally kind of um started to appear i think it was in 2018 there was the education endowment fund um kind of look into it and based on their findings uh pupils who participated in oral language intervention make approximately five months additional progress over a year uh rising to six months for students from disadvantaged backgrounds so obviously that was kind of pre-pandemic i guess um so but i think it's even more important now yeah, I think the whole thing about the pandemic, as any of us that lived with children know, um, or taught children, um, children weren't having the same kind of talk that was happening in school. Um, and in particularly in disadvantaged, uh, in children from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, in those in those households, talk was hugely um limited in a lot in a, in a lot of examples and a, and for a lot of children and i think whilst um some children sat around the table in the evening after doing their uh online learning in that sort of dreamy image and sort of sat around and discussing what they'd learned during the day <laughs> i'm laughing because i had two sons in the pandemic and i'm not convinced that i very often sat around talking about what they'd done in the day i think they'd had enough of me by the evening um, but children, um, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, were not experiencing the kind of conversation and the kind of talk that that was happening when they were at school. And it caused and it is causing a huge impact on um, on on their communication skills, essentially. And, and we're seeing it, you know, as, as performing arts teachers, as as all teachers, you know, I'm head of English now, but I have been head of drama. Um, we're seeing the impact of COVID on our children's communication skills. And I'm glad Keir Starmer's woken up to that. 
granted like we were talking about this on my on the sunday show like i i don't necessarily think it's the biggest thing in terms of um like what's wrong with education at the moment but but it is something that we can fix and that can be easily applied and and i've nicked nathan's login so he can't come and argue with me today but um he was saying that like in primary schools especially this is stuff that everyone is already doing and i think that's the thing that it, this is something that's really easy and something that people can implement, but it, it shouldn't be kind of dismissed as, as something that it, it can be really enriched and if done properly can have a really good effect. Yeah, I think I think a lot of kind of teachers who have, have been in the profession a long time, when the word oracy is heard, you know, it's it feels like it's a new label for something that's always you know, we've always kind of cared about and we've always valued. Um, but I think my sort of feeling about oracy is that when I've looked at curriculums um, and sort of sch and schemes of work, um, quite often someone might put oracy as an activity into something and actually it's just a discussion in the classroom. Um, and I say just a discussion because discussion is a really valuable part of oracy, but it, oracy is about structured talk and it's about giving children um, skills in order to have, um, to be able to talk. Um, and without any kind of scaffolding, just a chat in the classroom has its own value, but it's not an oracy activity because an oracy activity is about equipping children with the skills to um, develop a, a discussion or to uh, counter a discussion. Um, and so I think sometimes it is, I think sometimes it still is misunderstood. Um, and and as you say, like maybe not given the value that it, it needs in order for it to be effective. And I think it, it, it stems all the way up and as you go through the different key stages it's going to become more advanced and, and the more you can do it the more it's going to have an effect and I think that's the thing isn't it and I think with children in the younger years certainly that there's not as many parents going to bed and reading to their children or having their children read to them and reading out loud and things like that that there's there's that and especially more so with Covid when they were home for a long period of time and in school, they're not allowed their phones, they have more chat and more communication. And, and, and they having those conversations with their teachers, they're being prompted. But if they've been at home for that long time, they're not having those in depth conversations. They're not having, I, th I think as, as, as if you're not a parent of an as an educator, we don't know, we always inquire and we're quite inquisitive, but that's not necessarily where someone's mind goes. And I think it's, it's just eking out that extra bit of information and that extra way of thinking and, and, and developing the way they talk. And I think, I, I don't know, personally living with a teenager, he doesn't really want to have those conversations <laughs> with me a lot of the time. Um, and being in school, you know, in that environment, it's, it's an environment that's encouraging and, you know, sort of creating a space where they want to participate in those conversations, hopefully. Um, so I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of work to do. I do think that generally the primary schools I feel like are more equipped. I feel like um, in terms of their sort of oracy offer, I think at secondary, um, you know, it's really it's really difficult. The, the sort of the first research that I did on it within my school, um, I think it just it sort of highlighted to me that some subjects really feel that you know it's it's not helpful and it's not it's not useful i think i think that's really interesting i was talking to i'm doing some research on literacy at the moment literacy culture with middle leaders and i was talking to a, a middle leader recently um and it was a it was a science specialist and they were saying that a lot of the kind of strategies in terms of literacy aren't actually that helpful in terms of science because they don't actually in a science exam paper for example they don't actually have to have particularly high literacy like they need to have the science but they can on an extended mark answer they can just bullet point their answer they don't need to be kind of um writing in in the way that we need them to maybe in english so 
I just think it's really interesting. I think we come when in secondary, we come from a place where there's lots and lots of different dynamics and lots of different uh, pressures and, and needs. And I think finding a way for Oracy to genuinely embed at high school level, I think it needs to it needs to work, you know, it needs to be able to be worked in different subjects, but you know, in, in ways that are useful, useful to them. Um, it was interesting when I was doing a maths training on it, actually, because there was, there was lots of opportunity to discuss maths in a way that I, <laughs> as a non specialist, I, I wasn't aware of. But um, yeah, I think it needs to it needs to be it needs to be really um, supported by leadership and sort of pioneered by leadership in within a school. And it also needs to make be made sure that it can be, you know, whatever's happening is flexible to work for different subject areas when it's in secondary. And I think it's also like important to know the benefits of it, because obviously one of them is the cognitive game. So it improves the results and, and helps with retention of subject knowledge and it's transferable across um, different skills. And I think that kind of is reflected. There's obviously the um, from the creative point of view for art, we obviously use Oracy a lot and we have lots of things like that. And and we kind of have that discussion about what art is and how like and have those kind of conversations where we challenge students and flip things and 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 kind of like even the Dada and surrealist movements if that's still art and and kind of how art changes and makes people think so for me it's quite an easy thing for it to happen and actually um we had the um cultural learning alliance recently released a report on arts and it and it was quite a similar thing that it has um kind of an increase um people that do well in art has a reflection in their english and maths and things and i think it is a lot of that is actually down to the oracy and the fact that in art we're having those conversations and they're transferable skills and i think that's what people don't necessarily think is important as about art. oh it's just drawing but actually we challenge them quite consistently about what they're thinking and get them to think in different ways and that's that thing that's able to transfer to the other um kind of skills across the school and for me that was a bit of a light bulb moment i was like ah oh, they that's what it is that's why we have a, such a strong impact on other subjects if you get it right yeah i think um i th i think i think there are some subjects that find it more tricky i would say that and and the different types of the different types of talk as well um making space for different types of talk again has its own challenge um but again we're seeing um, part of the English GCSE is that they the students have to perform a speech um, and we're seeing a lot of challenge with, with, with children feeling anxiety about um, speaking in front of others and we've always had children who, who don't like doing that but the level I think that it's at now has, has been hugely exacerbated by uh, Covid you know. And, and it is that thing isn't it? In front of others it's that skill that's transferable. Like you have to stand and talk to people in an interview. Like to, if, if we don't give them these basic skills, they're really going to struggle. But if we can do it well and really equip them, they're going to flourish. Because for me, my earliest thought of kind of how Oracy impacted me was when I went to do my master's, um, I was the only full-time student. So I had half my lectures with the graphic communications full-time students. So I was like the random person in the room. And each week we had to present our, our design briefs that we'd done. And everybody in the room then went around and kind of critiqued it. And that was week in, week out. And like, it was so nerve wracking at the start to stand up and talk about what I designed and why I designed it and then have people criticize it. Um, but it, I just grew in confidence and it became this normal thing that every week I stood up and do it. And to be honest, I actually think that that's, that's kind of the thing that I got out of my master's that made me go and become a teacher. It built those skills to be able to stand up and present. And I think that's a little bit why perhaps teachers are a little bit reluctant maybe with oracy or like, oh, I've heard all this before kind of thing. But actually, it's just because we are very, very good at it. It's something that we have all embedded in our own kind of it's part of us as teachers to be good at oracy and um, that we're perhaps forgetting how difficult it is to get to that stage. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to, there's talking about sort of the impact it has in the future. Um, there was a survey done by, uh, so there's two surveys, one by CBI and Pearson. 
um, in 2016 found that 50% of businesses were not satisfied with school leavers skills in communication. So it was 50, so they compared um, in terms of what they weren't satisfied with in terms of school leavers, 29% was numeracy, 32% was literacy and 50% of businesses weren't happy with school leavers skills in communication. Um, and then, yeah, and 2018 LinkedIn did a study as well um, on skills gaps in the workforce and found oral communication skills emerged as the biggest skills gap by a large margin. So I just think those two survey, it's, it's like, you know, employers are telling us, yeah, well done, you've got the literacy, you've got the numeracy, you're improving, you know, in that sense, but no one's taking into account that you're sending these kids to us with their GCSE in English and maths, but they can't stand in front of a room. You know, they can't have a formal discussion. They can't, you know, um, and and the evidence is there to to sort of to show to prove that 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 it it needs to be taken seriously. I suppose it's that you can be the most intelligent person in the room, but if you can't articulate your idea, it's, it's never going to get off the ground. Yeah, it was really interesting when I was head of drama, you used to get, you know, people um, sort of people that worked in the army, people that worked in the police and, and consistently those people would come, you know, back to schools and say the most important subject I did at school was drama um, because it helped me to be able to talk to people or, or you know, present in front of someone or speak in a certain way. Um, and yeah, I think I, I think it's it's just being realised, really. But but it feels uh, I think we're in a bit of a middle ground at the moment because it still feels a little bit like a bolt on. Um, the, the the GCSE English spoken language um, assessment that that they sort of have to do, but it 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 doesn't um, count towards their GCSE. So they have to do it, or they don't get their certificate. But equally if they get a past merit or distinction it doesn't make any difference towards their GCSE so I think it still feels a bit um yeah just a little bit like an add-on at the moment like people yeah. are starting to take it seriously but it's not it's not taken seriously enough um or it's not being given enough time at the moment and I hope that that changes but it there's there's that other side of oracy isn't it that if you were to have an argument or have a conversation then then and talk it through and discuss it as a pair a pair or something beforehand then that's going to impact your writing and you're going to write better so like but it's it's one of those that they're not really seeing that side because in an exam you don't get that opportunity to kind of counter counter with somebody else before writing it down so it's, it's just that moment but actually you'd probably get more out of the students if they had that conversation first yeah and I think there's lots of examples of where we do that you know with um EAL students with um EAL students we might say in English write the essay in your first language um and, but before that we might say like tell me the story you know tell me the story write the story and then translate the story. So like speak before write is something that we use quite a lot. Um, uh, so it really supports children with like special needs. It, it really supports everyone, essentially. If, if you speak it before you write it, you, you generally feel freer than, than if you try and put pen to paper immediately. Um, what other strategies uh, would you recommend? Because I, I, you've given me loads over the years. Um, and, I was going to actually like add them in. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was going to drop uh, the the sort of the, the the most important text to get if you're interested in adding, um, starting to embed oracy into your curriculum um, is the the Voice Twenty One um, book by Amy Gaunt and Alice Stott, and it's called Transform Teaching and Learning Through Talk: The Oracy Imperative. So. Um, so yeah that that book is a bit like if you get a copy of that book it's a little bit like a handbook um a really um really fantastic uh assistant head in norfolk um i remember him tweeting and saying he basically is just taking that book into the classroom um every day um a couple of years ago and 
it, it's just got loads and loads of different activities, um, different different ways of kind of incorporating, like changing maybe what you were doing and, and sort of adapting it or, or adding in an activity. But it's really easy to use and I'd really recommend that. Um, some of the things I think it's really important to be playful and have fun and some of the things, some of the, some of the activities in there are kind of, um, yeah, are all about sort of being playful with, with ideas and others are ideas about, so you've got like fishbowl, fishbowl discussions, for example, um, they've been known as Socratic like discussions where you would have people in the middle having a discussion and then you have people outside looking in a, a, like a fishbowl. Um, oh, and so those people aren't having the discussion they're watching the discussion and they might be writing notes on the discussion and then and then you can flip it there's loads of different sort of versions of the fishbowl um but it can be really good if you've got students who are less confident they can sort of start on the outside of the fishbowl um so they're not actually they're doing a speaking and listening activity but they're not actually speaking you know they're listening at the start um and then maybe they get some ideas uh from you know from their sort of listening that might help them to to come up with their own their own sort of thoughts and responses because that's also been in the news as well about how um a lot more students are saying that they're anxious that they don't want to speak so therefore they're just allowed to not speak and but actually if we do kind of create these activities where they feel more comfortable speaking that there are those kind of social games it's meant to in enhance your self-esteem and reduce your anxiety uh doing these kind of activities and i think that's the thing is it's making it something kind of fun or making it kind of no consequences kind of it doesn't there's no right or wrong answer you just join in to kind of get them confident and build up those skills of speaking again especially when they've started secondary school and suddenly they're in a school with loads of different people from loads of different schools and it can be quite daunting to then speak in front of a big class but it's kind of creating those environments where it's okay to do that yeah and and I think um you know, they, they have something called sentence stems. Um, I think that's from that, that same book. Um, and it's, 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 we would use it, you, you know, you'd probably use it in art, we'd use it in English um, to, be, to kind of scaffold op sentence openers, but you can do the same thing with discussion. So you can have the sort of sentence stems on the board so that they feel safe in terms of how, how to approach a discussion as well. Yeah, I've done something similar that I think came from an idea like that, where it was, I've um, written a load of questions about the artist that they're looking and then they in pairs and they take it in turns. They can pick any question off the list to ask each other. So they don't have to come up with the questions. They've got kind of that bit. They've just got to decide which one they want to an answer. And, and, and you do see it that at the start of the year, they're kind of... Uh, like quite short answers but they do kind of gradually become bigger and better and and stronger at answering do you think this sort of new development do you think that that will change um do you think that that will spur sort of more change in terms of people's interest in oracy or do you think it's more um i don't know do you do you... i think i think a lot of people will be like oh well we already do that and i think it, it's going to be depending on how the schools deliver it. I, I don't think it's one of those that schools necessarily need to pay to get big companies in to uh, kind of deliver it. But actually, if they kind of can incorporate it into a, a personal development day where they can kind of show some different strategies or have that kind of strategy library where they can dip in and, and pick something and just get everyone having a go. I mean, my school... The last we've done oracy obviously a couple of years ago but the last year we've been doing um cold calling and challenge um and obviously questioning and cold calling that that's essentially one of them isn't it because you're you're challenging them and then but then you can add and build and challenge the questions and twist it and flip learn it but it's just giving them that confidence that actually they all that you need to give them that pause so they think and then you can pick anybody in the room and they, they've, they've had that time to hopefully come up with an answer so they're less kind of anxious and you're also kind of thinking about where you're going to pick. So you go for the uh, students that might be more anxious, you go for an easy answer and then you ch challenge the other students in the room. But I do think having everybody kind of on board that it's not in that single lesson that they're like, oh my gosh, when I go to that teacher's lesson, I'm going to be picked on and I'm going to have to say something out loud. If it's a whole like kind of school thing that everybody is going to speak, then it, it should have more of an impact. I think if it's just a sole lesson, it's going to not quite have the impact 
that it could have? Yeah, I think embedding embedding any of these, you know, elements, they have it has to be everyone has to buy in, don't they? I think there was I'm I'm gonna forget now, but there was some some figure about um children who are disadvantaged are the most likely to sort of say nothing in an entire lesson. It was yes. some it was something along those lines. They're the most likely to like literally not open you know not not respond not be asked a question you know not offer and it's and then when you think of the difference between what that child is like what the offer is for that child compared to a child who is really confident really you know high prior attaining um and the amount of interaction i think that's the thing it's like the amount of interaction that that child is getting with a teacher in an hour compared to a child who um doesn't have that those skills in RC um and isn't being kind of given an opportunity to or, or being encouraged to use to use them I think that's quite think, worrying yeah I think that's it isn't it the, the reason that kind of people from disadvantaged backgrounds have not got the RC skills as strongly as other people is that they're not having those conversations at home and I think it, it links a little bit with that kind of cultural capital idea that came about a couple of years ago and the fact that the the privileged students that parents will pay for their education that have orchestras like that's been in the news the number of private schools that have orchestras versus non-private and and kind of they're more likely to go to the theatre or uh, watch a play or or go to a musical or something like that but they or go to a gallery and look around the art they're going to be having those conversations at home they're going to be like oh did you see that in the news oh have you heard about this and and they're going to have those conversations at home and they're going to be exposed to a lot more things whereas those students that come from deprived backgrounds that maybe their parents are working maybe that they're, they're not around as much maybe it's a case that the telly's on whilst they're watching dinner and they're not really engaging with each other they're going to just be talking far less and I think sometimes as educators because we're quite chatty <laughs> and we are in that world of we all expose ourselves to things that we kind of forget that sometimes actually these kids probably won't will barely talk when they'll go home they'll go plug themselves in their playstation and play they'll eat their dinner whilst they watch telly and they'll probably go back to the playstation and then uh, go to bed like they're not or they're sitting on their phones and texting they're not having these conversations and that's what's kind of putting them behind but also they're just not getting exposed to different things and having opinions and having those debates um i'm just looking at so i, I referred to the all parliamentary group um and the inquiry report of 2021 so what you're saying is literally so professor neil mercer um who gave evidence to that inquiry said if students do not acquire this language at home, school is their second chance. If they are not getting it in school, they're not getting it. RC, therefore, is not just an educational choice, but a moral imperative. And that's Neil, Professor Neil Mercer from the University of Cambridge. I, th yeah. I think it's that. Like, um, we had a meeting the other day about something that we wanted. What do we want our, the kind of school's kind of targets to be for next year? And somebody said kind of, manners and, and that kind of rebuilding that positive kind of hello kind of speaking to people as they pass in the corridor but I also said that maybe it's because I'm a tutor of year nine that I really want to incorporate the how to debate when you don't agree with something so my year nines every day it's like oh I got a detention and I didn't even do anything and it's like well how do you have that conversation with your teacher so you actually a find out what it is that you did and b if you genuinely feel like you didn't do it that you are articulate set articulate yourself well enough that you're able to explain how that situation happened and who it actually was that was in that situation and but do it in a polite manner that's not going to get you in a detention or a longer one it, it's it's I just don't think that they have those kind of oracy skills to be able to communicate in in a really polite manner when they're upset either and I think that's something especially when you go on to work when somebody something doesn't go your way or somebody's messed something up and you get angry like there's you have to be professional and the way you articulate and talk to somebody is really important and a really important life skill yeah I think I think lots of people generally feel that that has taken a bit of a hit <laughs> um 
over the sort of over recent years and I think um you know that's our job isn't it to model model those things for children that maybe aren't necessarily being exposed you know in the way that we might like them to um I've got I've got a game do you want to play a game oh yeah go on then so one of the games so there's a couple of games I'm going to steal one uh it's not oh, I, don't, I say it's not specifically Odyssey but there's a there's a there's a kind of a game to start getting children talking um to each other so we'll start with that one the other one the next one has come from I've stolen from voice 21 so the first one I took from a performing arts specialist and it's called no you didn't I don't know if that's what it's called but that's what I'm going to call it um, and essentially you start to tell a story and then your partner interrupts at any point and says, no, you didn't. And you have to change the story. So it's up to you if you want to go first or if you want me to go first. OK, so uh, today at school, I had lots of work experience students with me. No, you didn't. I had. Well, you're right. I should have had less. But um, the other teachers were part time, so I ended up with more. Um, but they were very good and they assisted lots. No, they um, didn't. Well, you may be correct because of GL assessments, I didn't have as many lessons as I wanted for them to be able to help. So uh, they did what they could and they helped with a couple of the lessons. And then I had to find them other things to do. No, you didn't. Um, well, to be fair, no, they just tidied my room and started tidying my desk because they told me I was too messy. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, they were very <laughs> polite about it, you agree? But you can see. Um, yeah. So you can respond by saying, no, I didn't, if you need some, no, they didn't, uh, if you need some thinking time. But basically, uh, the stories can kind of get quite uh, far-fetched and quite crazy. And um, you can play them with primary school, um, you know, you can play them with high school. And it can be quite a nice way to begin if if you're if you want a sort of a uh, stimulus for something like an idea that happens that's that's unusual or something like that or just something that makes people laugh um, that's the thing it's re- it was actually really really hard to think on the stop without that that kind of take up time but actually also it was kind of really really fun and you imagine like the person saying it would it would, it would get the kids involved that kind of would be maybe a little bit nervous about getting started yeah because they just like to see how many times they can say no you didn't and you have to change your story so yeah <laughs> it's quite playful so the other one um that is so uh, voice 20 voice 21 and it's to do with developing cognitive strand and they call it if i ruled the world um they say groups of four to six so one person begins and says if i ruled the world i would and then they say something that they would do, but then they have to say because. So, for example, if I ruled the world, I would have a three day weekend because people would be happier. And then the person next to them has to say, even if they don't believe it, they have to say, I couldn't disagree more because. And then they have to explain why they disagree, even if they don't. Um, so they might say, I couldn't dis- disagree more because people would work less, which would mean the economy would suffer. So they have to, again, say what they would do um, and they have to explain it. Uh, sorry, they have to argue why why it's a bad idea and, and, and explain that. And then it's their turn to say what they would do if they ruled the world and why. And the reason it's useful is because uh, it requires logic and reason. So rather than a child just saying, well, I don't think we should, I, th- I think we should be allowed to wear fake eyelashes. Um, they have to be able to scaffold and, and provide explanations and propose new ideas. So I will begin. If I ruled the world, um, teachers would get paid more money because um, with the cost of living crisis and all of the pressures on schools, um, teachers aren't being paid a fair amount. <laughs> I, <again. laughs> I disagree because oh. no I couldn't disagree more so oh sorry really I important. couldn't disagree more because yeah. um those prime ministers need that money and they haven't got it in the budget so they can't pluck it out of thin air um, and then I I come up with one do I yes uh so if I ruled the world I would make it that all prime ministers had to work in a school for a day <laughs> so that they understand the pressures of a teacher and what it would be like. I couldn't disagree more because 
politicians have far too much to do that is much more important than working in a school and it would be a complete waste of their time so <laughs> so the idea is it goes around the circle of between four and six and uh you kind of watch it go around and they can all do it in their groups um and then what i do is i let my students know that i'm going to be asking um i'm going to be asking them what someone else in the group would have done to change the world um and that means that they have to listen to everyone in order to know what each other would have done so that's kind of quite a good way of like monitoring the group work but i think it's it, that it's, a, it's it's that thing isn't it that they have to listen they have to engage with each other yeah um and and i think that's the thing the difference isn't it to just and, having a chat you are really listening and you're engaging it and then you're interacting yeah and i think when you were talking about like kind of polite conversation it's impressing upon them you have to say i couldn't disagree more because because you're not allowed to go you're not allowed to say that's rubbish or yeah i, I think that's stupid um it's it's giving them the kind of formal uh, language that they have to repeat in order to do it so you're sort of creating that 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 dialogue and and that language that 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 we want them to be able to have um but doing it in a way that it seems like it's just a game so i would then carry on that with using sort of sentence stems uh you know for debate for example um and ideas for debate and it's quite interesting because some of the some of the students will come up with really you know i think everyone should be able to bring sweets to school or something and other students you know some of them will come up with really amazing ideas and, and sort of profound ideas and so whilst again you know whilst you could use it as an oracy sort of way in in terms of like how you articulate ideas in a debate it could just be ideas um you know for for something you know uh, for a painting for you know or something they were going to do in art that they you know that was an idea that they had from from that oracy activity it doesn't always i think it the idea that oracy has to sort of take over your lesson is 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 something again that i think we can kind of get rid of you know we, we want it to be something that yes you can take a whole lesson on oracy if you want to and if it's useful but also you can just use it to sort of springboard what you were, what what you were planning, so that those children have had a, had an opportunity to talk and, and discuss in the lesson. And I think it's that is that you can be a little bit nervous about giving it too much time. But actually, when I found it, I've done it where I got students to write about an artist, and they just wrote about it, and I talked to them about it. Versus a few weeks later, we had discussions and we did some oracy games and we discussed the piece of artwork. So they actually had far less time to write about it, but they wrote far more and more interesting pieces of writing. Uh, so it can have a positive effect in that way. You don't think that because it takes a bit longer or it takes time away from your task, that your task is going to be diminished in any way because actually it will enrich it. Yeah, I think, I think um, one of the things that sort of, always felt a little bit particularly from an English teacher's perspective um problematic with oracy was the lack of real kind of um rubrics and and sort of opportunities to use it for you know with marking criteria and things like that um and voice 21 or they have come up with a sort of marking criteria and a way of assessing oracy or different different ways of doing it but i think that is another thing that maybe makes people feel a bit stressed is is the idea that you know well where's the evidence that that happened how how am i going to you know evidence that if it if it happened in in the spoken sort of word and there was a time wasn't there where everyone was doing stickers and stamps verbal sign. feedback stickers yeah and it almost <laughs> we had a like, conversation about yeah, some work and now like we've stuck gonna, a sticker in yeah we're gonna end up with oracy stickers like we did an oracy activity and again like you know you don't need it's to not necessary you, no i i think it's that as well i think I, I do think that's the way teaching needs to go, that we don't necessarily need to evidence everything as much. I think that's how we take the pressure and the workload off teachers. I think it I, I generally think that it should be more internal observations that um, people and the, and good quality assurance, do, like for schools that you, that the senior leadership know kind of what everyone's lessons would look like quite regularly. And I know that's quite a, a scary. I don't know whether I'm kind of putting it out there that actually 
we should be used to being watched and have and being seen to have those conversations with students. And that's how that's kind of assessed. It doesn't need to be an extra piece of work or written in that we, we did oracy before we did this piece. It should just be kind of this natural thing that you see around the school when you pop in and out of lessons. Well, I think the schools that are really kind of, well, I think definitely in, in primary schools, I've seen that you, you see the evidence because the children become natural at using the unnatural ways of speaking. Um, and School 21, which is the sort of the, the school, I think it I think School 21 came first and then it was Voice 21 or I, I'm I'm not 100 percent on that, but I think it was that way around. Um, and when you see the the, the the evidence of how the, the children are using using oracy, it's it's natural, you know, and it comes it comes sort of naturally to them, and 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 that's because it's happening all the time, and and it's embedded. So I think they don't need stickers because they've got children speaking in ways um, that are you know impressive and are elevating their uh, outcomes because of the way that they're speaking. And I think that's that's actually something that like primary schools could essentially do. If you sent home a list of questions for their parents to ask their child at the end of the day. Um, I know mine specifically goes very chatty just before bed uh, to procrastinate. But it it's I think it, it's one of those that actually we need to build it in into everyday life and, and kind of build it into those other ones. And we can we can participate. That, um, I think one of our teachers had um, what was it called? I think it was called table time i don't think we quite got it right but the idea was in the in the the parent bulletin there was a couple of like topics that people could ask their their child and have the discussions around the table and it was kind of meant to kind of stimulate that chat um so i think it's it's one of those that if it's if it can be done really well in school but actually if you filter out to home as well it can have even more of an impact yeah i think I was thinking about when you were saying, you know, thinking about adults and oracy, I think is quite interesting because we, we know that children are impacted positively or negatively from the way that talk happens at home. But I was thinking about when you were saying about teachers being kind of good at oracy and I was thinking about ECTs actually, um, because I think uh, the new framework uses scripts um, for for trainee teachers doesn't it um so uh they essentially they write down in a script and they work from that what they're going to say in a lesson and i was talking to an assistant head recently about it because i haven't actually used i've got two ects starting in september but i haven't actually run uh under the new framework the ect program but he was saying actually it's really interesting writing down what you're going to say when you're teaching because he said actually really experienced teachers everyone could benefit from doing that occasionally um because it means that you think about the way that you're articulating your ideas that the the questions you're answering asking all of those things are, are written out and scripted and i think it feels a bit robotic i think to teachers that haven't come from that background but actually he was saying he could see the, the merit in it and i think um, I was actually on my, my level seven apprenticeship and actually people were saying that the trainees coming through aren't quite the same caliber as pre-COVID. And I think that is a little bit because they haven't had those RSC skills of, of standing up and talking and, and how to, to quickly change a conversation when the dynamic changes in a room or something like that. Um, but also from a, the mentoring point of view, it's definitely flipped to try and get it to have the student uh talking more so um i had jim knights on a previous show so do go back and watch that one uh looking at instructional coaching and the idea of of kind of very simply like kind of what did you think went well how would you scale on a one to ten if you thought that lesson was a six what would you do to get it to a seven and what would you need to do to get it to an eight and and how would that look and and kind of your not talking to them and not giving them the ideas they're kind of discussing it with you and then you give them strategies that they can kind of pick from and build in but essentially it's coming from the student the student are evaluating themselves and that's how you kind of build up those oracy skills and those self-reflection skills and I actually thought kind of 
as a men I've had trainees for for years and I think that that is a really good tool because a lot of mentors will just be like yeah I thought this was good and this was good and do your sandwich and what have you but actually the trainee isn't talking and isn't kind of engaging and coming up with it themselves I think it's interesting I think because I think I can see the benefit of the scripting idea and in terms of you know obviously if we look at it from the sort of adult or the teacher perspective um being able to structure what you're going to say but I think there's also the 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 danger of it becoming robotic and formulaic and you know when you sort of hear phrases used and, and you think well um you haven't really thought about the children that are in front of you when you're when you're saying that um I remember watching a trainee with a a top set who were really engaged and really um you know working really hard and 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 the trainee said now you kind of went through a whole bit of script that was about uh being kind to each other and you could see that the children were kind of thinking you know <laughs> a bit confused about the fact that they didn't feel like they needed to be reminded to be kind because they were planning on doing that anyway so i think i think there's a there's a i think i can see the value and the merit in script but also it's that thing of understanding your your room and knowing when to be flexible and be, I think, and be reactive yeah. and responsive i think that's the thing with oracy it's it's responsive you're just giving them the triggers and you're kind of teaching them how to be responsive um like i know for me even if I, I've got six different groups at key stage three, no matter what, every time I teach a lesson, and I quite often like my, my big oracy one is kind of we do Damien Hurst and we look at him at, over a series of projects. So originally we look at his bugs and we talk about whether it's ethical to use real life bugs. So they kind of get an understanding of the kind of guy he is. And then on a later project, we bring him back and he does the uh, wreck of the unbelievable so he makes loads of sculptures and then he puts them underwater and then he pretends to find them. And then there's a video of him talking about it. And he was like, these are thousands of years old, but like some of them are Mickey Mouse. And he's like, oh, this is a bust of the collector. Uh, he's clearly made himself look more handsome than he is, but isn't he really, really handsome? And it's actually him. It's a bust of him and he stood next to it. And and the kids don't quite necessarily click. And then we kind of just have a discussion about that. And then I bring in Jason Decarys Taylor, who creates sculptures and puts them under um, water and they grow coral and create artificial reefs. And we talk about kind of using art for money. So he's kind of generating a buzz. So his artworks are worth more. He's all about the money. He's not fussed about kind of how good they are or, or he doesn't even make half of them it's just to get the attention and the money whereas the other guy it, it's it's a love it's a passion and it's to create kind of attention and and really make something good of the earth and try and get people aware of it and and do something good and I think though every time I even though I've had that conversation for years every time I have a conversation about it with a different class there's different there's different outcomes they all tell me something different and it all flows differently um, and it makes me ask different questions and then quite often I'll go to the next class and I was like somebody in the other class said this what do you guys think and it and it's I think it's really nice when you, it can and they have this kind of they can be unfiltered and just give their opinions in this really safe fun way do you think do you think we will solve it for all children. Do you think it's possible? Do you think, you know, um, do you think it's I always going to be I, some I, children I, I, who find, you know, who are better at that and some children who really hate it and really struggle? I think it will be a case of it will take a time and a place for that student to find that confidence. And it will be a teacher and it will be a certain activity that will something will, that will trigger it. And actually they'll find their confidence. Like for me, it wasn't until I did my master's, which was much later on. I mean, I'd obviously started building up with that in the fact that uh, I was a scuba diving instructor. So I'd have to present and teach people how to do that. But um, but that was only literally in front of a couple of people. But I remember really getting nervous to do that. But it wasn't until I was like, right, I full on take everything and I do this every week and do it routinely that it kind of embedded me. There's still points where I'm like, oh gosh, I'm quite nervous in situations, but there's not many situations that I wouldn't happily go stand up or do something. I mean, I was quite nervous 
joining Teacher Talk Radio, but now I love it. But I still get a little bit nervous beforehand. But I think it's 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 teaching the students to be comfortable with those feelings. And I think that's the I think actually there's it's the mental health side of of oracy isn't kind of given enough credit because actually if we can get them to reduce their anxiety um or even even be confident enough to talk about their anxiety and have this thing that actually it's perfectly fine to discuss and have open conversations and all to feel that we don't need that we're kind of the stiff british upper lip where we keep things to ourselves and we don't talk but actually giving them these opportunities where they can discuss different things in different settings so like PSHE, for instance, might have one of those kind of scenarios where it might click and might open up to a student that's actually worrying about that. And I know that I have quite open relationships with my students that if if they are worried about something, I'm generally the person that they will come and talk to. And I think it's because from those younger years, I have those conversations where my classroom is a safe place that there's they're allowed to have their opinions. They can blurt out anything within within reason. Um, but they know that they're safe to say what they want to say about anything. I think I think you're right about art rooms being safe spaces. <laughs> I, always, <laughs> I always feel like when I go into an art room, it, it always feels really there's a there's a really calm and and I know it's probably not always calm, but I don't know. There's a different atmosphere in an art room that I think is really special, and I think it's really nice to think of oracy being championed in a subject that is about drawing because I think yeah we don't expect it we don't expect it to be uh in that place necessarily but I think it's that same thing of like in drama it's that place that you perform you learn to kind of almost have that alter ego and stand up and do those things and I think these are those extra skills that are more transferable to life and and that's like the more I'm doing teach talk radio the more I go through my educational career is that I definitely think that there needs to be more focus in schools in building those skills that are going to support our students in, in later life. And I, I do think that the lack of ROC during COVID with students being at home, perhaps because it's it was so monotonous and repetitive that they weren't really having those conversations with their parents because they were stroppy teenagers. Um, so it's kind of, it has put them on the back foot in terms of being able to to speak and be able to articulate themselves and be reactive to situations. I feel like they've got quite comfortable. Yeah, I mean, you could just turn your mic off, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the, the world where you just turned your mic off if you didn't want to speak, um, or you or you said that you didn't have a microphone. That was the classic, wasn't it? Yeah, or um, my, my my video's not working. Yeah, or my microphone. Okay. Or change your name to connecting. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were just so much opportunity to opt out and yeah. now what we need to do is reduce that and make sure students are opting in and I do think that there is that kind of but I think, I think as thing. well we take a lot of the responsibility on our shoulders um in education but actually you know when I'm looking at those facts from LinkedIn I'm wondering where the employers are you know because it would be so useful to have those people telling our kids look yes you need your english yes you need your maths but also i need you to be able to stand up and and make a speech because i have that on um uh norwich university arts they did a big survey of all, like thousands and thousands of employers and then they put together the skills that uh, most commonly came up that they needed um i might try and find that and just see whether i can reel off what they um had in there but I put that on um, my, uh, I have kind of starter booklet. So each lesson they have a different starter task on them. But on the end of each one, they have a kind of um, go through all those skills and also have a um, a somebody famous within that kind of sphere. So they kind of have an understanding of different careers within the arts. Um but let me find, I think I've got it right. So this is what the things that they, they say. So um, generally, here we go, um, creative studies and professional skills. So meeting deadlines, working independently, demonstrating a positive attitude, responding to feedback and positive communication. And I think that's the thing. You need to, you need to have, obviously, there's the self-dedication of, of the deadlines, 
But to have a positive attitude, you need to know how to regulate yourself and how to articulate yourselves and have a positive working environment. To work independently means you need to have articulated kind of what you need, what you need, what you need to do and know how to do that. Responding to feedback, again, that needs to be done in a way that you can articulate and ask what that feedback is and not get emotional when you hear about it and know how to do it well. But the most important one is is that positive communication. Uh, they, they're they looking for people that have those skills to be to be able to do the jobs. Yeah. And so maybe, you know, maybe if we're looking to improve our offer as educators, we're not only thinking about how we can make obviously really authentic and um and part of you know everyday everyday working in school but also in our sort of um interactions with employers rather than it just being necessarily about oh look this is a job you could do and this is what you would need to do it it would you know it'd be interesting to hear more from them i think about what they about you know the communication expectations that they have of of our young people and I think we notice it immediately when they go for their job interviews don't we yes. and we realize how li- how little we've prepared them I think well I think so um for that aspect of trying to get a job it, you know we've sort of spend all this time focusing on what's written on their CV but we don't spend enough time thinking about the person that's carrying it into the interview I think no I, so I agree I think we do need to see it be more championed by employers because it is I think it is one of the highest skills that you need to be able to be employed is to be able to articulate yourself I feel like if you can articulate yourself if you can even if it's not a very good idea I said earlier you need to be able to articulate your idea if it's good to get it off the ground but even if it's not a good idea if you can persuade somebody I've been reading a book on um kind of persuasive language if you can persuade somebody and get them on your side you can get your team motivated you're going to just go so much further like there are so many more skills and I think like you said I do think the primary schools kind of do have that more of a balance onto oracy it just seems to drop in secondary school and I think hopefully this will be the little kind of push that will maybe rebuild those skills that have been lost in covid and not only just build them it can it can enhance them to a point where we're actually sending kids out into the working world where they can articulate what they want and what they need but also do good jobs and be proud of themselves and and get that as far as they can because they've articulated their ideas and not kind of kept them to themselves because they're worried about what people might say i think so um i have to go (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to think of a way that I should say that in a more articulate manner. I was going to play the news, don't you worry. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Uh, if, if Phil wants to pop on and join in at the RSC chat later, he can do. Uh, but I'm going to play this week's news. Thank, thank you, you very for much, joining Hannah. me. Bye. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. BBC News reports that the school run by Ruth Perry, who took her own life after a critical Ofsted, has been rated good after a new inspection. Ms Perry died in January after receiving news her school was being downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. 
Ms Perry's death prompted an outpouring of anger about the inspection system, although Ofsted defended its grading process and said one-word gradings would not be scrapped. The latest report comments on the work done by the school to address previous weaknesses. The new report raises again the question of high stakes inspections. MPs are to hold an inquiry in the autumn and will look at how the system is working. Ms Perry's sister, Professor Julia Waters, said in a statement, the reversal of the previous judgment in a matter of months illustrates why schools should be given the time to correct weaknesses before the final report is published and that the latest judgment proves what all of those who knew Ruth and the school have known all along. Last month, Ofsted announced some changes which allow schools that were given an inadequate rating over safeguarding to be re-inspected within three months, giving them a chance to be regraded if they have addressed concerns. Teachers' pay has been in the news again following two further days of strike action from teachers in England. The Daily Mirror reports that Education Secretary Gillian Keegan is continuing to be under pressure to publish pay proposals or risk strikes dragging on even longer. All the major teaching unions in England are conducting fresh ballots after rejecting a £1,000 one-off payment for 2023 and an average 4.5% pay rise for next year. The government referred the decision on pay to the pay review body, who has reportedly recommended a 6.5% pay rise but the DfE continues to refuse to publish the advice. The Guardian reports on Labour's plans for education should they win the next general election. The article itself focused on plans for early years, which could see more graduate teachers working in nurseries and more nursery places in primary school settings. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Philipson said she wanted to put early years on an equal footing with schools to give children the best start in life. The TES gave further comment on Labour's plans as the party set out how it plans to boost teacher retention and improve standards. The plan includes giving early career teachers a one-off payment of £2,400 for staying in the profession and sending regional improvement teams to help schools. New teachers will be required to have QTS and they will also improve recruitment by cutting costs. The party, currently in opposition, has not made any comment on teacher pay. Finally, the BBC reports on what it describes as a crisis in waiting for children in care. In March, the government extended a ban on unregulated homes to children in care aged 16 and 17. This followed a BBC investigation which found some had been forced to live in caravans and barges and some had experienced abuse. The crackdown begins in October when Ofsted will begin inspections and all unregulated care settings will become illegal. However, some local authorities fear they will have to continue the use of unregulated accommodation, usually in houses and flats in res residential areas, because they will have no alternative. Regulated placements are suffering chronic staff shortages and a squeeze on places at the same time as a rise on numbers of children coming into care is causing continued issues. A D of e spokesperson said it was the responsibility of local authorities to provide safe placements but that it was investing £142 million over the next three years to ensure the transition to Ofsted registration is successful. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to support a question everyone will see at the start of next year. It goes something like this. Hi, Edu Twitter. Can you reply with where you are so I can show my class how far a post on the internet can reach? With a bit of free tech, you can make this much more visual. I'm going to use Google Maps because it's free, and most likely you'll have used Google Maps at some point in the past. So, when you have all your responses, sign into Google, go to Maps and click on the menu next to the search box. That's the three lines that look like a burger. From the menu, select My Places. You'll now have four options. Lists, Labeled, Visited, and maps. Click on maps and at the bottom select create map. Now you can give the map a title so you can find it next year for comparison and add all the places from your Twitter replies. Simply type the name of the place. When it appears with a blue point marker you can click the plus sign to add it to the map and then select the colour to help it stand out. When you're finished all places will be saved and you can access the map by following the first few steps. Menu, my places, maps. 
There are loads of other great tools to use also. Measure the distance from your school to those places. Hit preview and go into the view only mode. Here you can select the place and you treat it to a short bio and an image of the area. So next time you're looking to bring a lesson to life, why not try using maps to help pupils see where places are in the world? Do you have any top tips for mapping? Why not get in touch and tell us what you want to know about tech? I'm Steve Woods and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. So we're talking about oracy tonight and Edwina had some great points there. And I think it's one of those that it can be because this has come out about because Keir Steinmer has, has mentioned oracy and said that it should be. There's that instant panic of, oh, it's this buzzword. Oh, no, it's going to go on the Ofsted curriculum. Everyone's going to have to now do it. But I think that it's not necessarily the most important thing that drastically needs changing. The workload and, and, and the retention are the more important things, and that should be where his, his focus was. But Oracy is one of those areas where it is shown to have a big impact with little funding. And at this point, with where we are, that's quite an important thing in teaching is that this is something that we can do. You don't have to pay for big agencies to come in. There are quite simple, easy things that you can do that are going to create this positive effect on your students and um, increase the oracy. So we've talked about all the different areas um, that they can kind of do it. And we've, we've had some fun games as well. Um, but the other side of it that I want to talk about is is the civil engagement and empowerment. Um, so I think by having these conversations, we're exposing students um, to different things. And it means that we're giving them an increased understanding of social issues. So I think um, our curriculums blend well to be able to adapt and be able to talk about things that are going on at the time uh, in the news, in the world, or things that have happened in the past, that we're able to kind of have these conversations about kind of why things change. So, for example, uh, my students have been doing installation art, um, and we talked about kind of what installation art. Now, I've got a student that is in my form and in my art class and tells me pretty much on a regular basis that he hates art and art's pointless and all this stuff. He's very much a history buff and loves history. Um, but when I was like, well, what about statues of famous historians or famous people through history? Are, are they not art installations? Uh, and it suddenly changed the narrative. And he suddenly was like, OK, so actually I could write I could write about a statue that's on my favourite person from history. And actually that's art. I'm like, yes, that's art. That like art has been going on a long time. Um, but I kind of like that idea that it switched the narrative. And then we could discuss about... But if we were thinking about statues that have been pulled down, because actually uh, people put up statues of people that um, were in charge of the slave trade and they've all been pulled down because people don't agree with those statues and they don't think they should be up. So if we were to put a piece of insulation up, up now in 100 years time, is somebody going to disagree that actually that person wasn't the correct person? And, and I think no matter... There's always time for somebody to do something wrong. It doesn't mean that their whole lives are depicted by that, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily the right person or we know everything about them to be the right thing that needs to be celebrated. Uh, and then we also talked about things like, um, should public money pay for the art? And they're all like, no. But like, but if what if we put that bit of artwork in there and it generates loads of people coming and sitting and having lunch they then start using all the businesses around there and actually it regenerates an area that was really neglected really needed investing and actually that's a much cheaper way of doing it um and then it's like but then also you need to pay for a panel to inspect all the applications and make sure it's done fairly and make sure it's not just given to somebody's mate to um create the art installation that actually it's the right person it's the right amount of money so i think having these conversations and kind of using things that are going on around us to be able to really flip things and make people think and have those conversations and think about the social side of it can also kind of make our students more rounded and I especially think that not necessarily from our, our poor deprived students but from students that might not necessarily 
come from open-minded households if uh, we're at school having conversations about uh, gender identity uh, sexuality and things like that um, and then that is the same message around the school um, from different teachers having the same kind of conversations and that becomes more of a social norm and I think that's the thing that we are seeing a little bit more of now is that actually kind of the schools are setting that narrative and that oracy has had that positive impact that um, there is less homophobia I think in, in the younger years because we keep those conversations flowing about what it what is right and what is wrong and and kind of the opportunities and how you what what kind of language is okay to use and what is not okay to use and I think that we have a moral responsibility in that respect to use oracy to make sure that we're having an impact on social issues same with things like misogyny and and Andrew Tate and things now that has been quite a big one this year and having those conversations with students about what is acceptable language for how to speak to somebody of the opposite sex and what is not and that it isn't just kind of the female teachers saying this isn't how you speak to a woman that it's the male teachers going no that's not how you speak to them this is how it is and it's that common language no matter what teacher no matter what school that we're creating that conversation of what that norm is they might have that person at home where it's the opposite but it's it's that thing that, that we need the the greater voice the combined voice for those students to actually go actually there is another way of thinking and and hopefully that will kind of counteract that so there's that kind of side of it as well so we need to not think of kind of it just as kind of a little fad or something but actually there's a bit of a, a kind of moral responsibility of the impact that we can have if it's done properly and actually if we include these conversations and so you could have it as like an, a tutor time or a C kind of once a week as opposed to them just sitting there and watching news round are you having these kind of gritty conversations with your students where they're all getting involved are they sat all in a circle so there's nowhere for them to hide but you're just having these open and on the honest conversations where they can have their opinion but it's kind of fun and safe space to do it so i think it, it can go outside of the classroom in terms of just not just in lessons it can go into those tutor times and have those kind of ideas and I think it can just if you can get it right and you have those students building that confidence it can have a really positive effect and I certainly see it with my students in terms of getting them to write things down that when they've done those oracy tasks their writing it was improved but also challenge them in terms of their ideas so I very much like it that I'm, I'm like why are you doing that tell me why <laughs> explain it uh, no, but I want to know every detail you can't just say oh because I wanted to I just wanted to draw that or I just wanted to paint it that color I want to know exactly why you made decided to make that color uh, and then how you made that color and because I'm very mean I only give mine the primary colors they have to make everything them scratch and they have to explain it and why they did it so I think if they can justify themselves having that ability to kind of justify themselves but also regulate themselves the idea of kind of having that politeness that they're able to articulate themselves in a in a in a good way that they can get that across um so after school they have those skills and i think like edwina said they're obviously the oracy skills in terms of the english exam where they have to kind of remember a piece of writing and read it out loud but actually if kind of the first time they have a real full on quite intense oracy moment is actually when they're going for interview we, we are kind of letting them down having not built up those skills before they go to those interviews and that they are able to have those conversations and confidently have it because that's the thing if, if we all know when we interview we know when we've interviewed bad and we know when we've interviewed good when we've been engaging and calm and relaxed, maybe even a little bit witty, but confident enough to articulate our, our ideas. And that's what oracy can kind of really bring to the table is that we can give them those stepping stones to make sure they, they get those uh, jobs that they want. And I think that's the thing as well. This isn't a, like, we're just gonna challenge the top ones. Obviously it will challenge the top ones, but the ability it will give to the lower ones, the ability to 
build up those conversation skills, build up those um, things, because a lot of them would probably go into public service jobs, but they are going to have to communicate with customers and things. Most jobs have a customer one way or another, whether it be a client or, or just literally somebody in a restaurant. That's where most of their jobs are going to kind of start in somewhere that's going to have customers that they're going to have to deal with. Like most students generally have those kind of weekend jobs or but even even all the way down to even if they're just handing out uh, kind of newspapers, they're still going to bump into people. They're still going to have to be polite. They're still going to have to have those conversations. And I think if we can build them up so that they've, they've almost built this resilient to be able to think on the spot. If somebody asks them something they weren't expecting, they can't, they're ready for that. They know how to quickly adapt and respond. Then we're doing, then we're going to build them up as students and build them up as kind of little worker bees um, and do them the best that they can do. So it is obviously there's the cognitive games it is going to improve your results. They're going to have retention of subject knowledge because obviously if you're having to recall things, so it like it does kind of link really well with everything else. So you've got that recall. You could use it in that respect. They've got to have kind of challenging conversations about previous lessons. Like they have to recall that knowledge to kind of respond quickly to something. Then that's going to help retain that knowledge. And also, if you're kind of doing this across the school, and it's not just one place, everyone's doing it, they're going to have those um, transferable skills and they're going to really build on them. But it's 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 become this society where it's, I don't know whether it's just my school, but where students are like, I don't want to do that. I'm going to opt out. Like we're currently planning sports day. I've got kids that, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, I don't want to do anything. And I've got the ones that do, but it's a bit of a shame that they don't, they, they don't have that, kind of well at least I'll give it a go I was like if you give it a go we get a point if you even if you come last we get a point but they just don't even want to give it a go they're that very much that opt-out culture and I feel like RSC can help kind of eradicate that somewhat in the idea that it can um, enhance your self-esteem but also reduce kind of that anxiety and also I think those kind of uh students should we say that like to articulate themselves um too much or in a, a disagreeable way that actually if they can learn to regulate those emotions and even when they're in that kind of heated moment that they have those skills to be able to think and articulate themselves in a composed manner and project themselves in that way it can do a lot of good it can de-escalate a conversation or actually you can have that kind of conversation with them because they're not kind of just blaming you and shouting you. you're you having an articulate conversation and you can kind of understand and I think that's the thing it's getting them to understand exactly what they're saying but having that skill to be able to do it um quickly and that's the thing there are different types of talk that they need to be able to understand and be able to apply it's not just purely um one type they need to be able to um talk confidently obviously we want them to have that confidence to be able to stand and talk but also appropriately so they're able to kind of select the correct things to say at the correct moment and make sure they're really thinking about it and then also centered sensitive can't say sensitively so they're really thinking about kind of what they're saying why they're saying it and, but they have that ability to be able to do it the right way, that they're having that sensitivity. They can think about what they're trying to articulate and why and how they get it across. And I think I think RSC kind of blends well to kind of those kind of self-regulating things as much as it is building confidence. It's kind of actually regulating ourselves in terms of knowing the right thing to say as opposed to just saying and that's the thing we're teaching. It's kind of flipping it that we're not just talking at them. We're not just asking them questions, but we're genuinely engaging them and that we're making them really think hard. And we're thinking that they're thinking hard when they're talking. And there's an opportunity for them all to talk and that we've created a safe place for them to do that. So I think the more that they talk, the more that they do it, the more confident they will get. And that's the thing. The first time they do it, they are going to be petrified and it's going to be super, super scary and they're going to really, really struggle. But it's that consistency. The more they do it, 
the more regularly they do it, the more confidence they get with it, the more uh, they're going to find it, the benefit of it. So we need to make sure that we're doing that. And there are just so many different versions of, of kind of doing it. Um, I actually had my uh, trainee student this year. Uh, she did a placement at another school and then we met on a course and she was telling me about what she did. And I think it's uh, actually a really lovely example of how to get students to engage in oracy. So she was teaching Key Stage five and having just come out of uni she was really struggling to engage them and was trying to look at they were writing there in in art especially a level uh you have to write a 3500 word essay that goes alongside your project on kind of art history and the theory that you've done within that project so she was trying to get them exposed to other artists and things that were going on in order to be able to Uh, get them to really write better and think about different ways of comparing artists and exposing them to different things so they've got better arguments in their writing. Um, So she started doing little starter tasks. So she started bringing things in and they would read through them and then she'd try and have a class discussion, but it was a little bit difficult um, and they weren't really engaging. So then she did it that she... um, she did a, oh gosh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're called post-it note walls, like the digital ones. So the kids could type in and they they went up and they can all see each other's uh, post-it notes with their kind of ideas. So this is a kind of a nice way to kind of introduce it and build it. So again, they're still not quite talking, but they wrote it on their post-it notes, um, their digital versions, and they were able to see it. So then this kind of stemmed her on the idea. So now she started getting articles and sending them home for homework. So giving them what uh, think pieces, Um, And then at the end of it, they were then uh, digitally writing on their ideas and sending them in before the lesson. So at the start of the lesson, they arrived and all their different opinions about the article that they've just read uh, or artists that they've seen or uh, kind of a review of an exhibition are all on the board. So it's instantly kind of they've had that think and uptake time and they've given their opinion and now they get to compare them and argue about different sides of it. And it was really nice that it really kind of the kids started engaging. They were really excited to get the articles. They were excited to come in and have those conversations about the, diff- the different things. And it it is breaking them down and kind of working out slowly by slowly how to get them talking and how to get them articulating. And just by having this exposure as well to all these different social situations from different artists through time and the different kind of impact they had on the art world, um, meant that they just enriched their writing and they were able to articulate themselves much better having done it verbally um, and just giving them that exposure. So it could be something even as simple as that, like a little think piece that you send home um, before a lesson that they've written opinion, they come in with their opinion ready and then you're good to go and you can have them read them out, you can then debate them, you can flip learning them, reverse it. But if, if this happened how would that change the outcome and you can kind of have those different conversations with them so it can work all the way from primary school up to key stage five and beyond and I think it's giving them those skills and those confidences is what is going to really push them to become good uh humans when they leave school that they're going to have those skills and the skills that employers want they can go into interviews confident and they can go and start a new job confidently if they're not sure where something is they can ask if they're not sure how to do something they will ask because they've got the confidence to do it and uh, they'll stand up and they'll give a presentation I think those are the skills that we need our students to know because uh, they are skills that will help them uh, thrive when they when they disappear off after school um, so I hope you've enjoyed uh, our conversation on oracy and that maybe, maybe we've turned your mind about it. So please don't see it as a as a fad or just purely a new buzzword. Please see the positive impact that it can have on your student and uh, that the it can have a genuine impact. And it's important that we do think carefully about how we deploy it and that we... Um, give the students the best opportunity to be able to express themselves and see the positive sides of it, whether it be through cognitive games or uh, emotional, social games or kind of engagement and power 
embodiment of social issues. It just gives them the opportunity to understand a little bit more and articulate themselves and express themselves a little bit more. So thank you for listening and please come and join me on another Monday night. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.